many of you have been here before for a Kaler lecture? All right, how many of you have been here before to see Jeff Bryant talk about birds? <sighs> Well, Jeff Bryant is our speaker uh, this evening, and uh, I've known him for quite some time. I've been married to him for over 20 years now. <laughs> we met here in this very planetarium. Yes, we did, in a meeting of the Champaign-Urbana Astronomical Society, short, uh, a year after he had moved into town and about six months after I had moved into town. Uh, so his background is, uh, educational background is physics and astronomy. Uh, he did his uh, master's research on cataclysmic variable stars. Um, and a, a few years back, um, he started to develop a new hobby of, well, it started with photographing things up close, fossils and then insects and, and then, then, then butterflies. Well, I guess they could be, they're insects, right? Mm. Well, I'm not going to argue with a butterfly, certainly. But then it moved on to birds, and his telescope lenses got longer and longer. And uh, he has, he's going to be bringing it up when he uh, starts to talk. He's going to bring his uh, current camera and camera lens up uh, to show you all. And then I'm supposed to carry it back to the back. Um, the past couple years, we did talks uh, where we flew around to different locations. And we decided to do a little bit of it different this talk. So he's going to be concentrating on birds that uh, show a bit of color difference, uh, the ones that you would see in spring. You know, we've been through the winter. It's been all dreary. And now we're ready for that pop of color. Uh, but we'll have some old friend, uh, old, old bird friends in there as well. Um, what else can I say? Welcome, Jeff Bryant. Okay. Hello, everyone. Before we start, I just wanted to show a little bit, since she did mention a little bit of the camera, all the pictures that you're going to see tonight were all taken with this camera right here. This is not a super high-end camera. This is actually an older Canon camera. It's called a Canon 7D Mark II. And the lens that I'm using is a 100 to 400 millimeter lens. So anytime you're doing bird photography or wildlife photography of just about any type, uh, you need a long lens. Wildlife typically does not get up close to you, and my personal experience with cell phones, unless you have a really high-end, really fancy one, they typically don't do very good for wildlife photography. So you need something that you know, allows you to, you know, usually when I'm shooting birds, I have it fully extended out to 400 millimeters. Um, this is just a hobby for me. I don't get paid for this or anything like this, so this is about as big as I can justify as a hobby. Anything bigger than this, and you're talking a used car on the front of your camera, and uh, I would have a heart attack if I tripped and fell in the woods. So uh, this is probably as about as big as I'm going to get uh, during my hobby uh, anytime soon, short of winning the lottery. So anyway, I just wanted to show this before uh, the lights all go out so you can kind of see this is the camera that took uh, all the pictures that we're going to see tonight. So. So uh, if any of you, for those of you that raised your hand and said you've seen me talk in here before, in the past couple of years when I've given this talk, it was kind of a whirlwind. We tried to show every picture that I've taken in the whole area and we've flown over all the parks and stuff. A little bit hard to fit that into a uh, little 50 minute talk or so. So this year we've cut it back just a little bit to make it a little bit more reasonable. So uh, hopefully the pictures are still nice and you can kind of see some stuff that we're going to be seeing in the next few months or even now because we are starting to transition into spring and some of these birds are already starting to arrive. So. Let's just start right here. So this is a bird that pretty much everybody here is going to be familiar with, Northern Cardinal. Everybody sees these. These are here year round. Probably the first splash of color you're going to see because they never lose their color. Um, here I've got two different pictures of a male Cardinal in both cases, of course against a nice blue sky that you get in late winter, early spring. But then as, as uh, spring starts to transition, you start to see some of these colors show up. Uh, this is spice bush. If anybody's ever walked through Busey Woods, there's a whole bunch of spice bush there, and you get these nice yellow blooms early in the spring. So this probably is, uh, you'll, you'll start hearing these male uh, cardinals really singing on territory here in the next, uh, next few weeks, maybe even already. Um, uh, so this is kind of your first signs of spring when the cardinals really start going crazy. But let's transition back a little bit. Normally when you think of winter, uh, you don't really think of a lot of splashes of color from any birds that you might see. First of all, you probably don't see as many birds. And the ones that you see, most people just kind of call little brown jobs. They're just these little brown birds that kind of hop around. They're kind of hard to tell apart. That's typically true of uh, birds in the fall, as well as especially the ones that stick around in the winter. They're going to try to blend in with whatever's here. There's not a lot of green. There's nothing to hide them. So they're going to blend in with the, the twigs and the sticks and stuff that are all done. So you're going to get a lot of browns. But one unique uh, species, this is actually a sparrow. This is called a fox sparrow. 
doesn't quite pop as much on the screen here as it could if you ever see one actually in the wild, but uh, these guys have a really cinnamon red color to them. And so fox sparrows, if you look around, like if you go to like uh, Meadowbrook Park or something like that, and you look at for, for some of these brush piles, like when they go out and they uh, remove bush honeysuckle, look around in some of those bushes and you'll find things like fox sparrows and stuff starting to show up as well as a few other species of sparrows. And uh, these guys really pop because that cinnamon red color really shows up more so than it does on a lot of the other ones. So you can see one here that I took here hiding in some of the tall grass. This was actually taken at uh, uh, Meadowbrook Park. I think both of these were actually. Um, so these are kind of a nice early splash of color even before you really think of spring, kind of late winter. Then of course we're getting closer to where we're at right now. Everybody knows what this is, I assume? You guys have all seen these? Yes, red-winged blackbirds. These guys have just started showing up in the last week or two. I didn't even know they'd arrived until Waylena told me on her way into work here that she actually saw her first one. So, and we took a walk actually this evening before the sun set and you could actually see several of them. So these are kind of my first sign that spring is arriving when these guys start showing up and claiming what stick they're gonna perch on and cuss at you from. Um, but they're very territorial. Uh, if you ever walk through Meadowbrook Park during breeding season, these are one of the birds that might dive bomb you if you're not careful. They get very territorial, along with uh, swallows and things like that that come out around the same time. But um, these guys have already started showing up in numbers. Uh, this is a male. This is a female. So you can see the color differences that we see here. Uh, you don't see the full red here. They call it a red winged blackbird, but there's actually this little splash of yellow here too. But if you see them when they're on full display, that yellow kind of gets hidden, and it's like just looking at two red searchlights just shining right at you. All right. This is a bird maybe most of you probably haven't seen. Uh, I can probably, I, there's just enough light I can see here. Raise your hand if you guys consider yourself to be birders. Let's see a few hands here. Okay, a few of you. So you guys probably know what this bird is, but uh, a lot of the other people might not know what this is. These guys are actually pretty common in the spring and again in the fall. They're kind of one of the first birds to arrive and one of the last ones to, to kind of pass through on their way out. Uh, this is uh, one of two different types of kinglets. This is a golden crown kinglet. And for obvious reasons, I've got a golden crown here. And actually there's a little bit of an orange stripe right in the very middle. So when they get really worked up, sometimes you'll see that kind of really stick up. They almost look like a very angry looking little bird here. <laughs> look like they're gonna steal your lunch money or something. <laughs> But uh, these guys show up and, and they're, they're actually quite small. They're actually not a whole lot bigger than a, maybe a hummingbird. They're, they're pretty small and they move very quick, so it's actually quite tricky to get them to sit still long enough for a picture. So that's one species of a uh, kinglet. This is the other one. Now, I, I wish that I had a better picture of the one on the left. Ruby crowned kinglets typically look more like this. They're very bland. They don't really have any color. You don't, you don't see any hint of anything up there unless they get worked up, in which case you will then see this. And unfortunately, I don't have any good pictures. This is an example of a picture. I want to get a much better one, and I just haven't been able to find one because they're very uncooperative, and you, uh, you almost have to get them, you have to cuss back at them, <laughs> making pishing noises and things like that to really get them worked up, and sometimes you'll get them to stick that up. But get them to, getting them to do that and then peek out where you can get a good picture of them is quite tricky. So. I had to settle for one where at least you could see the ruby crown, but unlike the golden crown kinglet where it's always got that yellow stripe in the middle, the, go, uh, the ruby crown kinglet doesn't always show that little patch of color, but it's something to kind of look for. Um, but they have a very distinctive call. Um, so something I should mention, uh, because we are getting close to spring, the Champaign County Audubon Society will be soon putting together public bird walks. Uh, they meet every Sunday. Uh, at 7.30 in the morning in the Anita Purvis Nature Center over by Busey Woods. Um, I strongly encourage anybody interested in seeing what kind of birds pass through here to attend those talks. They usually go till about 9 o'clock. And then for anybody that wants to stay after, they sometimes continue on into Busey Woods and, and do stuff then. But uh, if you really want a good introduction to birds, you can kind of go with a group of people that know what to look for and when. And they can kind of give you a guide and get you started. So uh, those will be starting up, I think, in March, I believe. But um, Champaign County Audubon Society has uh, their own website with the calendar and stuff, so keep an eye on that. It'll be coming up here before too long. These guys actually are here almost year-round in low numbers, uh, but they do pick up in the spring and become a lot easier to see when they start getting ready for nesting and things like this. These are eastern, eastern bluebirds. And uh, the males, of course, are very brilliant blue with this kind of orange vest and a little white under, uh, you know, white bellies there. 
This is a female, um, similar in color, but just a little bit more bland. They tend to be more of, of a grayish blue, whereas the males are kind of a brilliant blue. But uh, I see a lot of these, especially if you go to Meadowbrook Park. Um, everybody knows where Meadowbrook Park is in Urbana, right? Mm -hmm. So pretty easy to go to, just uh, uh, if you stick near the creek and kind of walk the off trails, get off that concrete path where most people are, get off and walk on some of those creeks, and that, that's where you'll see most of the interesting birds. Uh, the concrete path, you'll see some, but if you really want to see the interesting birds, you've got to get away from the, where all the people are. So eastern bluebirds are a very nice uh, kind of a sign of uh, spring coming with uh, their bright colors. Now this one here is a bird that you might all confuse for something else. Waylena has a term for this group of birds. What is it? Funny looking goldfinches. <laughs> Funny looking goldfinches. It's not a goldfinch though. That's a good guess. It is, it is a group of birds called warblers. This particular bird is called a pine warbler. And so this one is one of the earlier warblers that show up. Warblers, if you look very closely at their beak, it's pointy as opposed to a goldfinch, which is going to have more of a conical-shaped beak. The conical-shaped beaks are made for seeds so that they can crack the seeds, whereas warblers have these long straight, and these, they use these for eating insects. So you don't typically get warblers showing up until there's bugs around because that's their primary food source, at least for protein. You get a few warblers that will stick around in very low numbers over the winter if they can find access to things like suet or things like that. They'll sometimes come to feeders, but it's not very common. Uh, most warblers don't arrive until the bugs start arriving, and so that's another good sign of spring. The pictures don't do it justice. These guys are, are really brilliant, brilliantly yellow, especially because at the time they start showing up, this is kind of a later, a later one when the grass is already very green. Typically, when they first start showing up, the ground looks more like this. It's mostly brown. You don't really have a lot of green yet on the, on the leaves or anything like that, and so this yellow really pops but they're typically going to be seen uh, hopping around on the ground looking for seeds to kind of get them by to, until the, the bugs really start showing up in bigger numbers. But um, uh, these guys will start showing up. But yeah, they've got double gold, I'm um, sorry, uh, double uh, wing bars. They do look a lot like a, a goldfinch, and if you didn't know better, you might think that's what it is, but they just look a little bit off, and that's why Elena calls them funny-looking goldfinches. And when she says that in the house, I come running with my camera to find out which funny-looking goldfinch it was. This is another one, and these guys are just now starting to show up. I literally saw a post, I think it was either this morning or yesterday, somebody in East Normal started reporting these guys. These are called yellow-rumped warblers. This is another one of the very early warblers that starts showing up. And uh, the one on the left here is a male in full breeding plumage, and the one on the right here is a female. They look quite different. And the one thing that I'm not showing in either of these pictures is the reason they have their name. They're called yellow-rumped warblers because they have a patch right above their tail that's bright yellow. Uh, sometimes people call them butter butts. <laughs> Unfortunately, it doesn't show up on the two pictures that I chose, but uh, uh, I do have pictures that show that, but I was going for a different goal in this talk here. So yellow-rumped warblers, usually when they show up, they show up in quite large numbers. They're very common, uh, also in the fall, uh, but you don't usually see them in their breeding colors like this. They're really pretty in the spring like this, especially when you get the males. Females pretty much look like this all the time, a lot more bland, but they all have a, a bright yellow patch right, right around in here that uh, doesn't show up in these pictures here. So that's something to keep a look at. If you're looking in, uh, um, uh, looking in your trees and stuff, out your windows and stuff right now, even before it gets really warm, see if you can see things like this out there. Um, these types of birds are not ones that are typically going to come to a bird feeder. You've got to look in the bushes and the shrubs and stuff. Now this is something most of us should be familiar with, and somebody already said earlier, what's this? Goldfinch, there you go. This is an actual goldfinch. This is the American goldfinch, to be more specific, because there's another goldfinch in Europe called the European goldfinch that looks very different, and it has actually very little yellow on it. The American goldfinch is very gold. This is a male, obviously, with full breeding plumage. It's got the nice black cap. But in the winter and in the fall, they look more like this. So these guys are here year-round, but they look a lot different in the fall and in the winter. And uh, when they get the, at least the males, when they get their full breeding plumage on, that yellow really pops. Most of the color we're going to see on birds, for the most part, tends to be in the yellow range of colors. Uh, you occasionally get birds that have other colors, but usually the colors that really pop in the spring are going to be these gold ones. This, of course, happens. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've seen any starting to take on any of these colors yet, but it won't be too much longer, and we'll start seeing some of these males developing their breeding plumage for the spring. Okay. 
Okay. Once again, look at the shape of that beak. That's a warbler. Very good. And that means that it eats bugs. This is another one of the early warblers that shows up. Normally when I see these guys, they're usually on the ground, just like the pine warbler that I saw earlier, although pine warblers you'll see in pine trees, they get their name for that reason. Um, but this is a palm warbler, P-A-L-M. Palm warblers, uh, they do have yellow, it's kind of on their under throat and kind of around their eyes a little bit, but it's a little bit more subdued and they got this kind of rusty cap on them. But um, uh, this is a female here, something you're more likely to see like in the fall or definitely with the females are going to look more like this. And then the, the males in the spring are going to look more like this. But that yellow is brighter than it looks here, but it is very isolated to just pretty much the front of the bird. But uh, usually I see them on the ground, and it's really neat to see them hopping around when the dandelions start coming out. But they are insectivores, as shown by that skinny, pointy beak. It's not a conical-shaped beak, which is uh, indicative of a uh, seed eater. Meadowlark. Meadowlark, very good. So. Um, there's a couple parks that I can recommend if you guys have never seen a meadowlark. They're probably not going to show up in your yard at a feeder or anything like that. At least I've never heard of anybody reporting a meadowlark at their feeders. These like big grassy areas. So if you can go to any areas in town that have big open grassy areas, a really good place for meadowlark is, um, if you know on the north side of town, if you take Mattis Avenue all the way to the north side of town over by St. Thomas More School, there is uh, right there along Olympian. It kind of goes off to the west and kind of turns into an undeveloped area with a bunch of sidewalks. It's called Legacy Drive back in there. You walk around that area and it's all just grass with sidewalks. And that's a great area for meadowlarks. They start showing up there very early. Very, it's a very common sound of, it just sounds like grassland to me. If grasslands had a sound, it would be this bird right here. So um, another one is uh, Robert C. Porter Park. So if you go to Robert C. Porter Park, uh, if you go to Robert C. Porter Park on the southwest side of town, uh, get on Windsor Avenue and go west until you get to Rising Road. And it's there right at the corner of Rising Road and uh, um, um, Windsor. And there's a small park there that has a bunch of walking trails and it's uh, kind of wildflowers and stuff. So in the summer it gets really grassland-like and they kind of maintain the uh, kind of wild area. It's not like a big city park. It's a little bit, uh, it's a small nature park, I would consider. And there's a pond there too, but they attract meadowlarks out there as well. So. All right, something else. Yes, this is a swallow. Which kind of swallow? No. Nope. nope. Tree sw Somebody said tree swallow. This is a tree swallow. There's, a, there's several different types of swallows. You've got barn swallows. Those are the ones that are kind of blue and orange. Uh, these are the tree swallows. They're kind of blue and white. And uh, once again, if you go to Meadowbrook Park, they have a lot of... Uh, birdhouses that I think are intended for both bluebirds and the swallows, and they, they really get territorial. I've been out there with my camera walking, and I kept hearing this weird sound, and I didn't know what it was. And then I looked down, and the sun hit just right, and I saw this shadow of something diving for my head. And it was one of these guys. Swallows are pretty much any type, especially even around Parkland here. Not, not tree swallows necessarily, but they do have some. They've got barn swallows here, definitely, but I think they have tree swallows as well. They make nests underneath the overhangs here at Parkland College, and people <laughs> often get attacked by these guys. They're very territorial. Um, I've never heard of anybody actually being hurt by one, but they definitely try to make their presence known. But uh, they, get, uh, they, they really start to stake their territory in, in, the, in the early spring, trying to figure out which nesting box they're going to use and then make sure to fight off any uh, contenders for that same space. But they're very pretty if you can get the sunlight to hit them. It's a very iridescent blue on their feathers. Then we start getting into what I would call the kind of the prime season of warblers. Uh, this is really as in, a little bit later into the spring when the bugs are really here. They've really got their prime uh, food source around. This particular one is called a uh, northern perula. And uh, I guess there is a southern perula. I've never seen one, but I think they're probably down in South America. But this is the only one we're going to see up here. These guys are, in my opinion, one of the more cooperative ones. Most warblers and any of these guys that eat bugs, they're going to go where the bugs are, which means usually back in the shady areas where there's lots of uh, bushes and leaves where they can pick caterpillars off the leaves and stuff. They don't usually fly out in the open sun where you can easily get a picture. So warblers in general tend to be very tricky to get pictures of. But these guys, I've found, because they nest here in the summer, not all warblers do. Some of them pass through on their way to Canada. These guys nest here, and so they get very territorial. I've had these, this guy here on the left, this guy here was only about five feet in front of me singing his heart out, and uh, just right at eye level. And this was in Crystal Lake Park in Urbana where I took this picture. 
Uh, but they've got kind of a rusty bib here with the yellow under his throat. He's got a little patch here on the back of his uh, shoulders. Got a kind of faint wing bars here and this kind of partial eye ring around the eyes. And here's another one that I saw in Robeson Park in southwest Champaign here that was just on the ground in front of me. These guys tend to be some of the more cooperative warblers compared to the others, so I kind of like perulas. Yeah, very good. Grosbeaks. These are one of the birds that I think I've had people email me at work that don't really pay attention to birds, but they decide on a whim to put a bird feeder out, and they see one of these guys show up. They've never seen anything like this before. They're actually quite common, especially if you have feeders. They really like black oil sunflower, so if you guys have a seed feeder and you want to see something you don't see too often, when they come through, I'd say probably in... I don't know, April, May, around that time frame, I think, is when they start showing up. They all show up at once, though. You'll have none of them, and then all of a sudden your backyard is just covered with these guys. And so this is the male. He's got this, you know, the rose-breasted gross beak. Gross means big, so you can see how big its beak is. Very conical-shaped, so that means it's a seed eater. So they will definitely come to your, uh, um, see, uh, your, your feeders if you put a especially black oil sunflower seed out. Females look a little different, though. And, and juvenile males will look very similar to this too, but sometimes you'll see little flecks of red in here as well. But usually the females are very brown, but they have the same body shape, that giant bill here in the front, and the very stripy with the kind of the big white eyebrow there. Um, but uh, these guys will show up in quite, quite large numbers um, in the spring. So something to keep an eye on if you put your feeders out. This is another bird that's actually, which one? Bunting. Yes, very good. This is an indigo bunting. So this is a bird that a lot of people probably don't realize how common they are. Um, this is one of the sounds of summer. These guys are here all summer long, and there's this kind of back, background noise that you hear, and you just, you kind of, your mind blanks it out. You just don't realize it's there. But if you listen, you realize it's something you've heard all along, and you didn't have any idea that it was this guy. They, they actually sing quite a bit. And they're here all summer, and they do nesting. Um, I don't see as many of the females. They're very, they're very brown. Sometimes you'll see just a little blue back here on their tail and their back end areas, and sometimes on their wings. But they're typically very brown, and they don't stand out very well. Uh, but the males, of course, they're very territorial. They'll stand up on trees. Um, but if you're looking at a bird that's already blue, and it's standing in a treetop against a blue sky, it just looks black. So a lot of people don't realize how blue they are unless you can get one to come down and you realize how, how just dark blue and vibrant they are. And so uh, this is one of our favorite birds. They do sometimes show up early enough that their primary food source isn't yet ready. So sometimes if you're lucky and you have seed feeders out, you will occasionally get indigo buntings, sometimes more out of curiosity than anything else, will show up around the same times that the uh, rose-breasted gross beaks show up, things like that. We've had a few show up in our yard the last couple years. And then once spring really gets going, they kind of get away from feeders. They're not typically a feeder bird, but they will occasionally in the early spring before their food sources are here will uh, show up. Now these guys here, we've been very lucky. I Only about three or four years ago I started putting jelly out for Orioles. Has anybody ever put a jelly feeder out? So uh, besides putting seed out, you can put grape jelly out in a little jar. You can actually go to bird stores, things like that, and they'll sell these bright orange feeders and stuff. Orioles are very much attracted to grape jelly. You can also put slices of orange out there. They like those as well, but they really like grape jelly. Um, if you put those out, you won't just attract Orioles, though. My, um, um, you will attract tanagers as well. And so what you're seeing here is a scarlet tanager. And I will tell you, this picture does not do it justice. This picture makes it look like it's about the same color as a cardinal. But I can tell you, cameras today, especially digital cameras, do not do a very good job of recording the color red. They're actually not very red sensitive at all. The CCD chips that are in those cameras are very sensitive to even infrared. And so to make those cameras look more like what our eye sees, they put filters in them to block out that infrared. But those filters are too aggressive and they actually cut into the visible red. So all the pictures you take with most modern digital cameras don't represent the deep red side of the spectrum very well. And so when I take a picture of a scarlet tanager, it is not as red as it looks to your eye. I mean, when you're looking with your eye, it almost looks you're looking at a red laser. They are really deep red. And so this was one of the males that showed up around the time I started putting jelly out, and they will also come to suet. This is a, you can buy suet cakes and stuff and put them in a cage, and I find that if you get the kind that's infused with cherry, it really will attract tanagers and stuff. So they'll come to the grape jelly, and they'll also come to these suet feeders. And uh, on the right here, you can see uh, what they look like in the fall. Very different, they, they turn yellow, but you can still see they have this black wing. 
but here you can see one eating a bug. Um, but yeah, the, the males show up, uh, they're very vibrant. And I'd, I felt lucky if I would see one in the woods once a year. And then I started putting that oriole feeder out. And now it's like I look forward to when the tanagers arrive, um, so do the orioles and everything. They all come in at the same time. And one year I had 12 of these guys in my backyard at once, which I couldn't believe. And then besides the scarlet tanager, there's also a summer tanager. These are here as well. Um, this, is, uh, this is what they look like when they're in their full breeding plumage. They, their wings are not as black as a scarlet tanager, and they're not quite as vibrantly red. This is more, more like a cardinal red, um, but the wings are not black. And here you can see one. This was in the early spring. I don't have a good picture of one of these guys in the fall, but they turn yellow just like the scarlet tanager does. But here's one where you can see it was transitioning in the early spring. It's still got patches of yellow in it here. So they, they get very red, but only in the springtime. Now, I mentioned Orioles. I probably should have reversed the order of these pictures here. This is a, an Oriole I don't see as often, but they are around. This is an Orchard Oriole. And so they tend to be a little bit darker orange than what you're probably used to if you've ever seen an Oriole, which is the bright orange Baltimore Orioles. Um, these guys will also come to the jelly feeders. Uh, we actually had one come last spring but uh, not as often as the uh, Baltimore Orioles do. And here you can see a juvenile male. So you can see how the color can vary throughout the season. Like when they're young, you'll get the, the males, with the, they're all yellow with this black throat, and then as they get older, their whole head turns black and their wings turn black and they get this kind of rusty orange color. Kind of about the same color as a robin's chest, if you've ever seen a robin's chest. So that's, a, that's an orchard Oriole. There you go. This is the one that's more common. If you have an Oriole feeder out, this is the one you're more likely to see, but you do have to look close. Uh, typically, the Baltimore Oriole is going to be a much brighter orange. Still basically the same body shape for both Orioles, but this one here will be a much brighter orange than the Orchard Orioles, which is kind of a rusty orange. And uh, here you can see a female here on the right. So uh, not quite as vibrant, a little bit more pale. Sometimes they almost border on yellow. But uh, these guys are, these, both these pictures were taken in my backyard uh, in the last couple of years. Now we're going to go back to some warblers again. So once again, as we get further into the spring here, we start getting more warblers start showing up, more bugs to eat, so more warblers that eat those bugs. This particular one here is called an American Red Start. And its name is kind of a, it's interesting. The way they hunt, I see this more with the females. This is a female here on the right and a male here on the left. I don't have as many pictures as males. They tend to be much more secretive. And because they're mostly black with only these orange patches, I find trying to get the right exposure of them really tricky. So this is one of the few that I have of a male where it actually came out well. Uh, the females are much more common and much more cooperative, but what they do is they will hop along sticks and, and tree limbs, and then they spread their tail very quickly, and right along the edges of the tail there's these bright yellow patches. And they're called red starts because they start the bugs. They, they, they kind of spook them, and, and what they do is they do that, and then the bugs go flying, and then they snatch them out of the air. Although it's interesting that really it's, neither one of them is orange. In fact, the females are yellow, and these are orange, not red. So why they're called a red start, not an orange start or a yellow start, I have no idea. Names of birds don't always make sense. This is another warbler that passes through in the spring. Um, these are actually one of the more common ones. Um, all of these warblers are coming through in quite large numbers in the spring, they come through in a very huge rush trying to get up north of their breeding grounds as quickly as possible. When they come back through in the fall during migration, they're typically more bland. And in this case, you can see this is a spring colored one. It's got this very black throat here. So this is called a black throated green warbler. Once again, no idea why it's called green because there's no green on this bird at all. Apparently the contrast between the yellow and the black kind of comes across in a distance as looking kind of greenish, but there's no green on this bird. It's just yellow and black and white. But um, this is called a black-throated green. And then in the fall, when they come through, they look like this. And you can see most of that black has totally disappeared. So in the fall, you get very big color differences and stuff. The breeding, the, the hormones, you know, they really get going here. And it really gets their feathers developed very nicely. And then on their way back through, they kind of take this slow, meandering path. So it's like a month and a half or two when they come back through. But in spring, it's a big rush. And you've got to look quick if you want to find them in their breeding plumage, because they're really trying to get up there quick. And they're taking their time on the way back. So this is a black-throated green in the spring, and then here's one in the fall. One of the more common warblers that passes through this area. Believe it or not, this is the same type of bird two different times a year. This is a male. This is another warbler. This is called a chestnut-sided warbler. 
because of this little red patch that runs along its, its chestnut sided. And it's got this yellow mohawk with this kind of black mask. But then in the fall, it looks like this. It's hard to believe that's the same bird. Well, not the exact same bird, but you know what I mean. Um, but you know, you see here in the fall, it's got this pronounced eye, white eye ring. You don't really see any hint of that here. But it's got this yellow mohawk that kind of runs down the middle of its back. You can kind of see a hint of that here. But it's amazing how much the breeding season has on a lot of these birds, uh, what effect it has on their appearance. Their plumage changes quite a bit. This is a, another warbler that passes through, probably one of my favorites. It looks like it stuck its head in a Cheeto bag. <laughs> anybody want to guess what this one is? Does anybody know birds? No guesses? What's that? No. Nope. This is called a Blackburnian warbler. And you can see the, uh, the males. This one actually came through our backyard and surprised us because we thought that the uh, migration season had ended. And this was like June or July. And this guy, and usually by then, most of the warblers have gone, the ones that passed through anyway. And this thing bopped through, and it was in full breeding color. So it really had this bright orange face looking right at me, uh, white belly with some stripes on the side and a black. But then when they come through in the fall, much more bland. So it's a, once again, you can see the big color difference you get between the spring and the fall. Here's another warbler, another one that has a tremendously different colors in the spring than it does in the fall. So here, you, this is a magnolia warbler. This is a male here. You can see it's got kind of this necklace with these little stripes that come down from it. They're very pretty when they're in their breeding plumage. And then when they come through in the fall, they're much more bland. That whole necklace is gone. There's only a hint of some little streaks on its belly here. Uh, sometimes they, have a, they preserve a little bit of that in the fall, but this is a particularly bland one that I found in the fall recently here. And uh, you can see how much, once again, the breeding season can affect the color of their plumage from one season to the next. Um, not the best lighting on these two pictures, but you can kind of see it here. This is called a Cape May warbler. So you can see it's got these rusty eye patches here. It's kind of a golden necklace here around its neck with really strong streaks here. These guys really like blue spruce trees, and unfortunately we used to get a lot of them in our backyard. And unfortunately we lost this blue spruce tree because it started getting an, uh, an infection in it that had to, the tree had to be removed. It was dying. And, uh, but unfortunately, we don't have hardly any blue spruces left, and so we don't see these guys in our yard as much as I used to. But they're one of my favorite warblers just because of the nice, interesting mix of colors. It's not just yellow and black, but it's got this kind of rusty red in there mixed as well. And this is what they look like in the fall. So uh, quite a bit of a color difference between spring and fall. There are too many warblers. Yes, there are. <laughs> That's usually the challenge that most birders have when they first get into birding is trying to figure out and be able to identify all the different warblers. And especially when you get into the fall when all the warblers look almost the same. It becomes confusing fall warbler. If you think they're hard to remember all the ones that come through in the spring, try in the fall when they all have the same plumage. Uh, so here's another one here. This is uh, once again spring and kind of fall. This is called a bay-breasted warbler. And here in the fall it's just kind of another one of these. Can, it looks like a funny looking goldfinch. And between this one and the next bird I'm going to show you, if you look at them in the fall, about the easiest way to tell the difference between them is to look at the color of their legs. That's really about the best way to tell them apart. That's how similar some of these confusing fall warblers can be. But in the spring, they look quite dramatic, and they look completely different in the fall. And this is a black pole warbler. And once again, look at it in the fall. That looks almost just like the bird we just looked at. And one of the only differences, occasionally you'll, you'll see a, a, a little bit of, on the bay-breasted warbler, you'll sometimes see just a hint of some color under the wing. But on the black pole warblers, you won't see that. But if you look closely at their legs, sometimes you'll be able to see. See how orange they look? The legs here? Black pole warbler has orange legs, whereas the, uh, the uh, bay-breasted warbler has black legs. And so in the fall, sometimes the only way to tell them apart is to look at the color of their legs. So that means you've got to look really close. If you're up for a challenge, get into studying warblers. And then we're back to, back to the beginning here. So 
I have way more pictures than this, but like I said, this year was supposed to be a little bit more controlled than previous years. We have a talk that's after this one, so I wasn't allowed to run over. So, but I think we still have, we're at 740, so we have time. If there's any questions or anything like that, if anybody has. Before um, we do the, the questions, yeah. I do want to break in and ask a few uh, questions or make some um, additions to what Jeff's had to say. He mentioned that when we put out the jelly feeders that it, it was a couple of years that we didn't see any. We might have been getting the Orioles and the Tanagers and just didn't realize it, but all of a sudden we noticed we got a whole bunch of them, but it was 2020. We were home. <laughs> oh, no, that's true. <laughs> and the windows were feeders. open. <laughs> So every time he heard a different sound, he'd get up from the computer and they were everywhere. When it started warming up, I remember in 2020 when I was working at home for my computer job, I'd be sitting there in the computer room with the window open and I would often be taking a lot more breaks because I could hear a bird out my window and I would go running down the block to try to get a picture of it. <laughs> the neighbors got to know him as he uh, would you know, go up onto their yards to get birds that were in their trees. Uh, yeah, I up. do want to remind people, if anybody's interested in birds, by all means, they're public, they're free. Uh, the public bird walks that we have in the spring and in the fall um, during migrations, both the fall and spring migrations, they have public bird walks. And as long as you're there by 7.30 in the morning, which is, granted, if you're a morning person, not a problem. I'm not a morning person. As she mentioned, my background's astronomy, so trying to do these two hobbies is killing me. <laughs> I'm used to staying up late and sleeping in, but trying to stay up late and then also get up and be at the park by 7.30 in the morning does not always work out very well. All right, I think we do have some questions. We have one here. What's that black and white thing behind the cardinal? Black and white thing behind the cardinal. Right there. You mean down here? Yeah. I think that's just some dead leaves that showed up in the picture here, I think, from the previous season. I'm not aware of any other things in here other than whatever this is in the background here. But, uh, I just like this picture because of the, the, the buds that were coming out in the spring here are from the spice bush, uh, spice bush in uh, Busey Woods. Do we have uh, any other questions? We can also go back to some of the pictures if, uh, if, any, if, if, if you've got specific pictures. Yeah, if anybody pictures. has questions about any of the pictures mm -hmm. that I showed. Do you ever see owls? I do. I didn't include them in, in, the, in this talk. Like I said, in previous talks, I included pretty much every bird I've seen, and that like took an hour and a half to get through them all. And it's like, we can't do that this time. Um, but yeah, there are owls. Uh, the two owls that are here year round are uh, mostly barred owls and great horned owls. Uh, those are the big owls. And then there's screech owls that they're around, but they're very secretive. Um, people that put up uh, screech owl boxes can get them. We, we have a guy that we know that actually up in Gibson City had one and he, they would come back every spring and he would walk down his uh, walkway to, to leave for work every day and they would all be looking down at him just from that little bird box that he put up. So sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll get that. Screech owls are very tiny. But if you live in Urbana, there's a lot more owls in Urbana than there are here in Champaign because they do like more trees. And Urbana tends to be a little bit more woodsy than Champaign does. So, uh, but I have heard owls even from my house in southwest Champaign. Um, she thought I was in the computer making bird sounds on the computer and we didn't realize it was a great horned owl that was outside her house. And we could hear it through the walls. So they are around. Um, but uh, I didn't include them in the talk because they're just not all that colorful. They tend to blend in with the wood, so they're usually kind of brown. But uh, snowy owls, we get those in the winter if you're lucky. Didn't get lucky this year. I, usually every year I get one snowy owl picture, but uh, this year I didn't hear of any passing through, so it wasn't quite consistently cold enough to bring the Arctic ones down. What's the rarest bird you've seen? Uh, rarest bird for this area. Some of you guys might remember this. In 2015, does anybody, does anybody remember when we had what was called a swallow-tailed kite that came through? I don't know how many of you are that much into birding, but we actually had signs for a while that were out on I-57 saying this way to the swallow-tailed kite. It's a bird that's normally found in Florida, and they're very common there. And they're mostly all white with black wings, and they've got this really long forked tail. And it's called a swallow-tailed kite. And swallow, because if you look at barn swallows, they have that forked fork tail, and their, their tails are like that. And they usually eat uh, dragonflies and insects and occasionally small snakes in Florida. And uh, that, in 2015, we just happened to have a really good dragonfly year. And we had one that for about two months hung out right, right near the corner of uh, Windsor Avenue in Madison, Champaign, and uh, was flying right above our heads. It would perch up on the tree, and we had people from Chicago driving down to see it. And so that's probably the rarest bird I've seen in this area. Um, other rare birds, but they're pretty obscure. You're also talking rare birds um, that 
was it the Blackburnian warbler picture that you showed? It wasn't a rare bird, but it turned out when you went to file it that it was rare because of the time of year you found it in its breeding colors. Yeah, when you, when you say rare, that can mean different things. It could be rare just worldwide, like, like a hooping crane. A hooping crane is a very rare bird because there's not many of them left. I've never seen a hooping crane. I'd love to see one. Um, sometimes they mix in with sandhill cranes, and if you're willing to travel to Indiana during migration, there's often a, a migration path where you can go and see tens of thousands of them. Hooping grains will sometimes mix in with those. I've never been lucky enough to see one. That would be the rarest bird that I would probably ever see, since there's probably only a few thousand of them left in the world. But um, the, uh, um, as she mentioned, sometimes rare means it's rare for that time of year. You know, they may pass through, but it's just coming through at the wrong time. And a lot of times, birders will try to track all the sightings that they see so that they can kind of submit surveys of what birds pass through, what areas. And sometimes if you go to report a bird that shouldn't be there at that time, you'll have a hard time finding it on your list because it's considered rare. So you have to make sure to check the include rarities item on the list when you do that. And so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is not a native bird, and I, ha I have not seen that. I have not seen that emu yet. I don't know if they'd allow you to report an emu on a. Yeah. Have any of you seen the emu like live and in person? No, it's I, I haven't either. I know people that have. Yeah, you saw it. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. Question. Do these birds ever live in like gaggles, like geese or ducks or whatever? Do they live in pairs or solitary? Uh, it depends on the type of bird. Uh, most of the warblers, when you see them, they they travel often in mixed flocks. So you won't just see that one warbler. You'll usually see that mixed with. They all eat the same food, so they'll kind of all go to the same areas wherever the wherever the food is plentiful. You'll see mixed flocks of warblers. They're not paired up necessarily. They don't, a lot of the warblers, when they're passing through, they're trying to go up north. Most warblers breed up there. There's only a few that stay here in the summer to breed. Northern perulas, common yellow throats, a couple others that'll stick around here and they do their nesting here. But most of them are in a rush to get up there. So they haven't quite paired up yet because they're not on their nesting territory. But um, other birds, that, you know, there are, you know, birds like geese and ducks and things like that that kind of like live in groups of stuff. Most of the ones that are, I can think of that are super colorful, I don't think of them as really hanging around in groups other than flying in mixed flocks together just because they're going after the same food source. But, mm -hmm. Actually, I have a follow-up question. Now. Yeah, sure. Uh, why do they migrate? Why don't they just sleep in the south? Uh, it depends on what they eat. Um, well, first of all, the birds that migrate, typically it's because what they eat isn't available here in the winter. Like if you're an insectivore, sticking around here in the winter is going to be really hard to feed yourself because there's just no bugs. Unless you can like dig into the bark of trees, which there are some birds that do that, they get by by eating sap and things like that, but there's no berries. Um, the bugs are all gone. So unless you're very specialized to eating the types of things that are here all winter, you've got a migrator, you're just not going to survive. So what the migrating birds will do is they'll go down south, um, um, I'm sorry, they'll go up north to breed, but then uh, they, they have to fly down south where, the, where their food is still available in the winter. So most migration is usually food driven. So his question was, why don't they stay in the south instead of coming in? Why did they come north? I honestly don't know. It could be maybe it gets too hot for them. I mean, it, it could. I mean, I know, I know that there are some birds where, you know, there's, where eggs and stuff are temperature dependent. Maybe it gets too hot for those particular eggs. I don't know. And it may depend on the type of bird. But uh, there are some warblers that stick here, but others that, you know, some of them don't go very far north. They go just like up into Wisconsin and Minnesota, and they don't go any further. Well, in the north, there's a huge increase in insects. I mean, if you haven't been up there, which I have, I mean, it's crazy how many bugs are up there. I've heard stories of people that, like, have gone hunting to Canada, and they talk yeah. about how bad things like deer flies. It's like, yeah, yeah. bugs up there can get really bad in the spring and summer. Open, you'll have bugs in your yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's purely the food source up there. There's just huge numbers of bugs up there. Hmm? All right, we have another question here. Why do scarlet tanagers have to be so bright? Because <laughs> they like it. <laughs> they are probably one of my favorite birds just because of how bright they are. Like I said, the picture doesn't do the scarlet tanagers justice. They're, they're, they're the brightest colored bird I can even think of. So if you guys are willing to put feeders out, I strongly recommend you try putting out Oriole feeders because it won't just attract Orioles. And make sure there's grape jelly in there. They really like grape jelly yes, more than any other type of jelly. I tried putting elderberry jelly out and some others, but they really like grape jelly. I thought I saw some raptors flying around lately. Have you seen any? 
She just saw two Cooper's hawks today that apparently, we've got a pair that hangs around. They'd actually nest just outside of M-Wing, just on the back side here. And uh, it's probably that pair that's just starting to come back to their nest. Their nest is still there. It's in the same tree they've done it the last few years. But um, uh, Cooper's hawks are the ones that if you have a bird feeder in your backyard that attracts a lot of birds, you're going to attract Cooper's hawks. Uh, I mean, people sometimes get horrified, but when you feed the birds, you feed all the birds. Uh, you're going to attract the little birds that eat your seeds, and then those birds that eat those birds are going to come because that's where their food is. So Cooper's hawks are the ones you're more likely to see if, you're in, uh, um, if you've got bird feeders in your backyard. You've got red tail hawks that obviously are around. Uh, they typically, t they're, they're ambush predators. They like to go out on the uh, open fields and kind of get mice out in the open fields. They can't turn as quickly. Cooper's hawks are true hawks. They're a little bit smaller, and they can turn, and they can, you'll see Cooper's hawks fly and like very quickly navigate through a set of trees, and they can turn very quickly. I've seen a red-tailed red hawk try to do that. They're not nearly as successful. They end up backpedaling and like trying not to hit the building. And don't um, forget the sharp-shinned hawks. Sharp-shinned hawks uh, look very similar. I call them assault pigeons. They kind of look like a very small Cooper's hawk, but they're very similar in appearance, but uh, you'll get those sometimes. If they migrate through, they're not here very long. And eagles. Eagles. We have eagles, and they're increasing in number. We've actually got a nest in Savoy. Um, there's at least five nests that I'm aware of in Champaign County alone of bald eagles, and they reuse the same nest every year. So I think this is the fourth or fifth year for the um, bald eagles in Savoy, and they have at least two young, I think, every year. Um, so. My red house fell out of the tree, mm -hmm. and I finally got it back in. Is there any chance? I don't know if wrens will reuse nests or not, but there's so many wrens in the area that I'm sure if you put the wren, the, the wren house back up, a wren will definitely take it back up. I mean, I'm just afraid that the house fell down with the wrens in it or something. I mean, do they overwinter here? Carolina wrens do. Okay. House wrens do not. Uh, there's also a winter wren that's here only in the winter. But in the summer, you get both house wrens and Carolina wrens here. Uh, Carolinas will stay year round, though. Um, they have multiple broods. Um, but um, wrens will nest anywhere they can, including your house, if they can get into it. Um, I've seen people that often leave their garage doors open and the wrens will go in there and try to make a nest and stuff hang hanging on the walls. Mm -hmm. And they're very noisy, raucous little birds, even the young ones. But don't mind. Tiny <laughs> birds, but very big. They have very big personalities. <laughs> so some things in the spring that I, as a non-birder, have noticed. Um, you can see birds um, migrating on the weather radar. You can see them taking off uh, in the uh, evening. It looks like yeah. little donuts uh, at all the radar stations. Yeah, during, during the peak of migration, um, they fly very low, but uh, uh, birds that migrate do usually migrate at night. And so what will often happen is you can literally watch weather radars in the spring. And you, if they're set for the right sensitivity, uh, especially there are dedicated radars that uh, actually go out of their way to do this. Sometimes weather radars that are strictly weather, they filter that out as noise. But if you go to other sites that especially de uh, are dedicated to this, they will actually pick up. And you'll see as soon as sunset hits, you'll see suddenly these donuts start appearing near radar stations. That's usually picking up just the, it's not individual birds, it's just the huge mass of them as they're migrating over the radar stations, all the radar stations will start lighting up. And that's usually just the huge numbers of birds that migrate through this area at night. Something and related to, to that, if you get one of those nights where you get the one storm after another after another because it's just training all across and you don't get any sleep, that's when you want to look out the window the next morning because that's when all the Orioles and all the gross beaks and you all can, the tanagers show up. You get what, what's up. called a fallout condition. And basically what happens is birds are trying to fly north to their breeding grounds, but then you get storm systems get set up and they essentially create a wall. The birds will not fly in rain. So what will happen is they'll, they'll hit that rain and they'll just literally, they'll fall out and just in the thousands and millions into local areas. And if you go to a park where there was like a storm that popped up in the middle of the night, say two or three in the morning, all the birds that were trying to migrate were forced to stop where they were at. And if you go out to the park early in the morning after one of those rainfalls in the middle of the night, you'll often see huge numbers of warblers in the parks and stuff. Those are great nights to look for it. All right, I want to thank Jeff for uh, sharing his photos with us and his stories.